So uh, I will begin by issuing a health warning. Don't try to make any connection between what I'm saying and the slides. They're, <laughs> they're purely there as eye candy to entertain you. I did ask our slide librarian if we had any images of British archaeology and she produced about 5,000 pictures of the Staffordshire hoard and 17 rather depressing looking images of the rest of our archaeology holdings. <laughs> so I'm afraid I've taken the coward's way out. Uh, and uh, I've also rather taken the coward's way out uh, with the paper because what I'm really doing is presenting a series of reflections on the history, a very peculiar history of Birmingham museums and the nature of our collection, our audiences, and some of the projects that we've been doing recently and the way we want to go in the future. But I don't really come to any hard and fast conclusions. I'm not describing a fixed set of outcomes. So Birmingham Museums is the largest civic museum service in England, if you don't count Liverpool. And we don't count Liverpool because it gets national funding. Uh, and, and we don't mention Glasgow museums, at least I don't mention Glasgow museums. My senior management team have taught me better than that. <laughs> However, all three cities did claim to be the second city of the British Empire in the 19th century, and probably they all, are, all were, in a way, and they all certainly have enormous museum collections. So we have a collection of around a million objects, depending on how you count the moths and the birds' eggs and all that sort of thing. And they're displayed and stored in nine venues, uh, six of which are listed buildings and one is a scheduled ancient monument. But in Birmingham, the collection predates the buildings. Um, with what I now recognise to be a characteristic caution, the City Council took quite a long time before it decided actually to build anything and it started collecting before that. Uh, local worthies like the journalist John Factory Bunsen, the charismatic preacher George Dawson, beseeched the city to build a museum and art gallery, uh, but the city wasn't having any of it. Uh, and in the end, the council was enticed into building Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery because a group of local manufacturers essentially bribed them to do it by offering them a large sum to create an acquisition budget. And as a result, a Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery opened in 1885. It wasn't the first building they'd acquired. They'd acquired Aston Hall some years previously. Aston Hall, of course, famous for giving its name to the local but not very successful football team. And I believe the first property to be taken into care by a local authority. However, the Tangye brothers, won the hearts and minds of the city fathers, and they were fathers in those days, and they had the beards to prove it, as our portrait collection demonstrates. I've always wanted to do a, an exhibition on Victorian beards. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Boston, Birmingham beards, it would be a success. Uh, and their argument was instrumentalists that the artisans of Birmingham needed to see the best of art and design so that they could compete with the artisans of Paris and Munich, who already had that advantage. Um, and the original letter from the Tangy brothers says rather plaintively, what good is a museum in South Kensington to our artisans when for all practical purposes it is as far away as Paris or Munich? And thanks to the efforts of the London and North Eastern Railway Company, it's still as far away as Paris. <laughs> However, the elected members were at last persuaded. And so at the outset, the collection was very much dominated by flat art and decorative art. And indeed, perceptions of Birmingham's collection are still heavily dominated by our large and exceptionally fine collection of pre-Raphaelite art, which consists of oil paintings, works on paper, stained glass, textile, ceramics, metal objects, wallpaper design, furniture, and so on and on. And in the early 20th century, the scope of our collecting broadened and uh, the local newspaper proprietor, for example, John Feeney, whose bequest built most of the galleries that now make up the Museum and Art Gallery, uh, donated a, a substantial and interesting collection of Japanese art 
and his colleagues, other newspaper proprietors, invested in excavations in the Near East and, and collected that way. And at last, the history of Birmingham itself began to be collected, but it tended to be the history of rich white men like Bolton and Watt and Chamberlain. The city began to acquire more heritage sites. One of the first of these was Blakesley Hall in East Birmingham, uh, an interesting Tudor farmhouse. Uh, it has excellent archives and it's been excavated. And the archives include fascinating stuff about evidence for spectacular family quarrels. There was one branch of the family <coughs> who came for Christmas because their house uh, was being redecorated and they wouldn't leave and I can just imagine it how many of us have not wished for our families to leave after Christmas and we later added the historic properties of Soho House which was Matthew Bolton's home, uh, Serhole Mill which is Tolkien Associations, uh, the Museum of the Jewellery Quarter, a complete jewellery workshop and Wheelie Castle Almost all these sites, with the exception of the Museum of the Jewellery Quarter, are now conveniently placed in the middle of areas of multiple deprivation. So if you're interested in the history of vandalism, they're ideal. Uh, and if you're interested in community engagement, they're also ideally placed. However, it's somewhat perversely, instead of using them as the base for community engagement and conveying a wider sense, not just of the below ground archaeology, because most of them have been excavated, but also the wider landscape. Birmingham Museums has historically chosen to interpret the heritage properties very much as single period dwellings of rich people. During World War II, the Museum and Art Gallery was badly bombed. The director who oversaw the post-war construction or reconstruction it was a lady called Mary Woodall, who was a fine art historian. In fact, she was the fine art historian's fine art historian. She specialised in Italian Baroque. I don't wish to disrespect her. She did a lot of good work. She expanded Birmingham's art collection away from British art and made it much more balanced and European. However, she also committed some heinous acts. Uh, she sold off a David Cox, which had been part of the Nettlefold bequest, thereby giving rise to a 60-year vitriolic correspondence with the descendants of Mr. Nettlefold, which still continues to this day. And she gave away a collection of South Asian metalwork, which we would be very glad of now. <coughs> There is an oral history recording of her which I very much treasure. In it she talks about boxing in the magnificent Victorian Industrial Gallery, which is a superb example of Victorian cast iron. And she comments merrily that it was fortunate she did not destroy the original gasoliers, adding that they used it for a display of period costume and it was awfully pretty. She describes Blakesley Hall as boring, uh, but Aston Hall, on the other hand, looked lovely because she was allowed to go on shopping trips for it and furnish it as it should be furnished. She explicitly <laughs> describes attempts to portray the past of Birmingham as parochial, and she praises the continuing acquisition of material from excavations in ancient civilizations as being of more universal value. And unfortunately, Mary Woodall was not an isolated phenomenon in Birmingham museums. I have spoken to a number of former curators uh, of local history and archaeology, and they have described how a succession of directors at best overlooked or at worst denigrated their subject. There was an implication that the history and archaeology of the city was somehow intrinsically of lesser value, less intellectually credible than fine art, and therefore less important. There was never a museum of Birmingham history. Birmingham history has figured traditionally rather little in the galleries. And the nearest that the city ever got to a museum of Birmingham history was the much lamented 
uh, old Museum of Science and Industry in New Hall Street, uh, which unfortunately was demolished. It was created in the 1950s and, and demolished in the 1990s and replaced by the hideously named think tank around the time of the millennium. And this is despite the fact that Birmingham did have some really excellent local history and archaeology curators. It had names like Stephen Price, Nick Molino, and George Demidovich. And they collected extremely actively, and they had big followings and uh, engaged most strenuously with local societies. But it is as if after they left, a lot of their knowledge was lost. Uh, and although there was, when I arrived, a curator of archaeology of some standing, uh, his focus was on numismatics, and the archaeology collection has not really been actively curated for some 20 or 30 years. Now, I think this is very unfortunate, not just because um, I've accumulated the odd degree in archaeology, but because having worked in some fairly major cities, I'm aware that the thing that interests people most is the history by which they include archaeology of their local areas. And Birmingham is like other major industrial cities. Almost everybody has come from somewhere else. And very often <coughs> this tends to be forgotten and people assume that they and their families have been there forever. Thus, most of the people who now describe themselves in certain pubs in the city which I avoid as proud Brummies uh, are unaware that their ancestors hailed from the rural Warwickshire. However, it is a documented fact that the great increase in population in Birmingham in the 19th century was mainly drawn from rural Warwickshire, with much smaller but more noticeable numbers of Irish immigrants. And, of course, the audiences that we're now living with are completely different again. After World War II, large numbers of immigrants arrived in Birmingham from the British Empire, particularly from the Caribbean and South Asia. Uh, almost all the taxi drivers in Birmingham are descended from people who came from the Mirpur region of northern Kashmir, because, British, because a dam was built there and they got permanent right of abode. It's quite interesting to have late night conversations with Mirpuris about their antecedents. And there are smaller numbers from Punjab and Bangladesh and so on. And in fact, I just want to say as a footnote to history, we should all be very, very grateful to the Bangladeshi entrepreneurs who created what are called Indian restaurants. Because if it weren't for them, we'd all have been consigned to post-war British cooking in perpetuity. And I remember it, and it was ghastly. <laughs> and immigrants continue to arrive, of course. So the net result of all this inward immigration is that Birmingham is now one of the youngest and most diverse cities in Europe. And by the time of the next census, the, the M will be irrelevant because they won't be in the minority anymore. In fact, at present, at the present birth rate is it's believed that uh, it will be about 50-50 before the next census. So what does this mean for museums? Uh, well, a couple of years ago, one of our Bangladeshi partners said to me, cheerily, Ellen, you're never going to get the Bangladeshi community to take an interest in the pre-Raphaelites. And all your current white visitors will be dead in 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do then? <coughs> well, first of all, my art curator and I, we think we can rise to the challenge. We think there's lots to interest new audiences in pre-Raphaelites. They had extremely complicated and unseemly private lives for a start. Poor old William Morris, it does seem very unfair. He was a much more attractive person than Dante Gabriel Rossetti. And my art curator is also researching the subject of Dante Gabriel Rossetti's wombats, which apparently is, is both interesting and tragic. And uh, I think it can generally be demonstrated that pre-Raphaelite art is is much darker and more unsettling than it is often portrayed as being. But I think the real in point of engagement for the future is in the history of Birmingham. About a decade ago, one of my predecessors recognised that not enough Birmingham history was on display, and we embarked on a project to create a, a suite of Birmingham history galleries. 
And these opened in 2012 and uh, have been very popular and continue to be very popular. But we are very well aware of the fact that uh, there is a gap in them. They follow the history of the city from the medieval moated manor through the period of Bolton and Watt up to the Second World War. And after the Second World War, they more or less stop. And they more or less stop because we haven't collected anything to put in them. So we applied to the HLF for a project called Collecting Birmingham, which was intended to at least to begin uh, filling the gap. Now, in Birmingham, unlike a place I'm not allowed to mention, Glasgow, uh, there was no tradition of working class people just giving things to the museum. They didn't feel that sense of identification. Uh, and our, our collections of what could, for a bit, want to a better phrase, be described as working class history were very sparse. So collecting Birmingham was about getting to know the, the communities of four of the inner city <laughs> wards. Uh, and our, our original intention was that we would acquire a lot of objects by, by purchase. We set up an expert panel to advise us. Uh, and off we set. And we were completely wrong. Uh, about what was going to happen and in fact the project morphed several times and turned into a much slower project with a lot more conversation. Uh, the expert panel somehow melted away because we realised that when it came to the inner city history we were talking to the experts. Uh, it was a much slower process of conversation and exchange and getting to trust each other. It emerged that in particular in particular, the uh, Caribbean population did not trust museums, but in general, there was a lot of mistrust of museums. They were seen as posh, uh, places where people like us didn't go. They would take your things and hide them, and they would never be displayed. So we had to get to know these communities and do it their way rather than telling them what we wanted to happen. And as we started to get to know them, uh, one or two people of influence gave us some key donations and other donations began to follow. And we did make some major acquisitions by purchase, but they have been much outnumbered by the donations. And we'd learned to ditch some of our assumptions about what people were and weren't interested in, uh, uh, the immigrants, their children and grandchildren, weren't very interested in the history of the dead white males like Bolton and Watt and certainly not Chamberlain uh, and actually neither were the white working class. Uh, what they were interested in was how the city had changed physically the history of their local areas and how people in their local areas had lived in the past and a lot of this is subsumed in what I certainly think of as archaeology. Their definition of, of history is very broad church, is what I'm saying. So the team had to learn to follow the community and not to direct them, which came quite hard for some of our curatorial staff in particular. And this chimes with other projects I've done. Uh, there was a community archaeology project in Glasgow, the Castle Milk Community Archaeology Project. As the name suggests, Castle Milk used to have a castle. It was the site of one of the big post-war housing projects in Glasgow that were intended to address Glasgow's notorious uh, housing problems. Again, uh, we thought that we would go in and uh, it would be good for everybody to do a bit of digging and uh, a bit of rootling around in the collection and all jolly good fun. Uh, and it just didn't work out like that. We did do some digging, but not very much. Uh, we didn't manage to engage the local male population at all if they were under the age of 12. They stayed firmly in the local pubs. Uh, we exchanged, we in, engaged mostly with grandparents and grandchildren. Um, we drank oceans of tea and occasionally ingested the odd biscuit. And what eventually emerged was a completely different history from the one we had been envisaging much less about the castle, much more about the servants. The, uh, there was a particular interest in a rather errant countess who had existed in the 18th century. A lot of history <coughs> about the children's home that the castle had eventually been converted into. 
and uh, a lot about more recent history as well, about the history of rent strikes and political protest. So how do we apply all this to Birmingham? Well, Birmingham is often described as a city with no identity, and it's, it's true that the continuing redevelopment of the city centre leaves it with very few landmarks. And it's also true that unlike Liverpool or Glasgow, the people of Birmingham are, on the whole, rather modest and self-effacing, like, a bit like hobbits. <laughs> but the city does have a very strong identity, and it's bound up with making things. Uh, and also the modesty hasn't prevented Birmingham from having a very long and glorious history of rioting, very good at rioting and civil unrest. Uh, and our, our audience research shows that the single topic or collection area that, Burm that people of Birmingham, regardless of where their ancestors have come from, are most interested in is the local history of the city. And in particular, the history of their local area. So people don't say they come from Birmingham they come from a particular part of Birmingham. And the pre-Raphaelites come almost as far down the list of topics as Charles Rennie Mackintosh did in Glasgow. I think he was 48th out of 80. Although that may have improved since his main building burnt down. <laughs> and the consuming interest in local history has been very much reflected in reaction to the Staffordshire Horde, which is seen by everybody, again, regardless of gender or ethnicity or age as theirs and part of local history. Uh, and, and why wouldn't you love it, the nice piece of Anglo-Saxon warrior bling? And we've been doing work on the history of Birmingham in relation to the British Empire. We did a project funded by the Arts Council Changemakers Programme called The Past Is Now, which looked at the history of uh, Birmingham and the British Empire and how had that, the British Empire had been we engaged six young South Asian activists and we had an internal team and uh, I wasn't involved in it. But apparently it was very stormy, there was a lot of shouting and people threw things and there was a lot of adverse comment on social media and rather to my surprise my staff came out of this enormously cheered up and uh, just wanting to decolonise everything. You know, there isn't going to be anything else in the new museum but decolonisation, I had to point out that there, there are other stories to tell. There are stories about women and uh, people with disabilities and gender issues. It can't all be decolonisation, folks. But I see that as part of the process of re-displaying re the whole of Birmingham Museums and Art Galleries, and in fact, rethinking the whole museum service, that archaeology has a crucial part to play uh, and in this context, it's very unfortunate that our archaeology holdings are in a terrible mess. In fact, I had that nice Lorraine Meatham in my museum the other week, and she said, Ellen, this is the worst I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just fortunate that our archaeology holdings are in our main store, which is about two metres away from the route of HS2. So my plan, which may be cunning or not, is to apply for a massive uh, community, HS2 community grant, and have a huge community engagement project in sorting out the archaeology of Birmingham once and for all, as far as it's humanly possible. And I hope that in, in the process of doing that, it's not just a mechanical process of reboxing and, and marking and, and bagging, but that we can actually engage people in the whole history of the landscape and cityscape that we can get community groups engaged in co-curating stories for the new displays, that we can create uh, reminiscence kits and handling kits for schools, and just generally raise not just the profile of archaeology, but the profile of the past of Birmingham in general. Uh, and at long last, we'll be able to tell the truth about the servants at Aston Hall. So I think if you've been listening, Thank you very much.